and why, as an evolutionary biologist, someone who sort of studies, studies sex and gender in detail, why, why do you think that this has become the, the crux of so many of these conversations? Well, I, I see it as a, like a slow motion train wreck, completely unnecessary, but can't be stopped because everybody has a sense that they have a dog in this fight, and we all do, but people do not understand where their interests lie in this discussion, and so they are lashing out, for lack of a better term, in an attempt to shut down that which they think threatens them. But their map of what is threatening to them and what actually serves their interests is almost random compared to the reality of breeding systems and what people actually want. And the irony is, inside of evolutionary biology, this is all pretty well understood. It's not By that this, complicated. What do you mean? Male, female sexual dynamics, what they mean, and uh, what different social systems are about. So this conversation, there's no debate inside of evolutionary biology about whether males and females are basically the same. We all know that males and females are not basically the same. There are many things about us that are the same, but there are also many things that are different, and those things that are different may be inherited genetically, they may be inherited culturally, but they all have meanings. It's not an open landscape in which you can just uh, design whatever you want. So what I see is wishful thinking everywhere and people imagining they are much more informed about sexual dynamics than they actually are. I guess what a lot of people fear when they hear evolutionary biologists talk about sex roles is that we're, they're trying to sort of reimpose roles that were cast off in the 1960s and 1970s. So this, this is an important misunderstanding. The roles that we have recently abandoned are almost unbelievably ancient. My favorite example involves looking at a flower that contains both male and female parts in the same structure. A flower that has both male and female parts has a difference of opinion within itself about how enthusiastic to be about sex with strangers. The male parts are gung-ho for it. The female parts, not so much. The female parts, in fact, at a structural level, are coy. They put the pollen grains through a test in which pollen tubes grow down through a long structure in order to reach the ova. So we can decide that we either do want to retain female coyness in some form or that we want to reject it. But what we can't do is decide that that was imposed by some sort of Puritan uh, viewpoint amongst uh, males in, you know, in recent times. It, it's not. It, it stretches back far enough into the past that we can find it across the animal kingdom and if we look into plants it separately evolved but nonetheless the same pattern emerges there. So we should alter the dynamics of sexuality for modern times and we should do so with fairness in mind. I'm very much in favor of this. I'm married to a woman who views the world in masculine terms. I mean, she lives in a way that makes sense in masculine terms. She goes to the Amazon, she you know, enjoys adventure of a certain kind. I'm all in favor of women doing things that are not traditionally female, but I'm not in favor of pretending that femininity was invented by men to keep women chaste or something like that. It wasn't invented by humans at all. Because this, I guess, is another part of the the discussion because from a sort of postmodern viewpoint, even using the words masculine and feminine, by, they assume that those are culturally defined and then you get into a question, well, what do you mean by masculine? What do you mean by feminine? And you, you then sort of enter a language game in a loop um, where they sort of don't refer to anything. But what you're saying is they actually do refer to things you can study right down to, to flowers and to plants and to, to things that are not, that are not human. There's a, actually a very simple story that accompanies this truth, which is there are very few creatures in which gametes are the same size. There's an unstable equilibrium in which gametes are equal size. And what that means is that gametes in 
any creature that has two sexes will tend to have one sex with small mobile gametes and another sex with large sessile gametes. Once you have that dynamic, you have an asymmetry in the interest of the parents in investing in those gametes. Small mobile gametes are not worth investing heavily in, and large sessile gametes are worth being choosy over because the investment that they contain is greater. Now that has almost nothing to do with us at a direct level, but every time we have had creatures evolve in which there's an asymmetry of investment in offspring, you get other things evolving as a consequence, like choosiness. It is natural that a creature that has larger gametes should be choosy. It is natural that a creature that gets pregnant should be choosy. It is natural that a creature that has offspring with a long uh, childhood should be choosy. Now in human beings, we have a really interesting situation where men reproduce by two strategies. Men can love them and leave them, in which case they're not very choosy because why should they be at an evolutionary level? And men, more generally, invest in their offspring, in which case they have every reason to be as choosy as women do. So human beings are not some standard case from nature. They're a special case and an interesting one. But to imagine that females being more reluctant about sex was the idea of men who wanted to impose something on women is preposterous. It exists in birds, it exists in insects, it exists in trees. And when you're talking about sort of masculine and feminine going down so deep, what I, what I hear is sort of the potential for that even to map onto some of the ancient wisdom traditions. The idea of the, of the Tao as being the yin yang going sort of right down in, into being, that, that you have this sort of masculine and feminine dynamic playing out. Do you think that, does that kind of analogy work? Absolutely. And in fact, there's a, an important evolutionary principle discovered by a biologist named Fisher. Fisher's sex ratio principle says that it is actually, although males can produce many more offspring in a lifetime than females can, on average, males and females produce the same number because for every male who produces an above average number of offspring, there's some male who produces a below average number of offspring. So the variance in males is high, the variance in male and females is lower, but the average is equally valuable. So sex ratios tend to be even at birth because there's no evolutionary advantage to producing males or females. In fact, what you want to do is produce that which is in lower supply. This is a perfect yin-yang. They are not symmetrical and identical in that sense, but they are compatible symmetries that reflect uh, a balance between two forces. And the punchline to the joke is that we are not one or the other. Evolutionarily speaking, all your genes but a handful spend half their time in female form and half their time in male form, and so they aren't really about one of these two strategies winning out over the other because half the time they would be on the losing end. It seems that there's a, a, a confusion between is and ought, that a lot of the time, and you saw this in the Jordan Peterson, Kathy Newman interview, where Jordan Peterson was describing the way that things are, Kathy Newman was immediately taking it as, that he was saying this is the way that things should be. You're, you're saying that I should, I should do this. Is this, is this part of the, the, the substructure of this conversation? The is ought question is absolutely basic. You can't really have any of the important topical conversations that we need to have without covering this ground and realizing that to describe what is is not to imply anything about what ought to be or even what can be and maybe that's the third partner in that uh, in that triad when we look at evolution and biology we are looking at a completely amoral landscape there are many wonderful things in there there are horrifying things in there evolution is responsible for all of our best characteristics and our worst so at some level, we should be having the conversation not about, well, you think this is what is, therefore you're defending it as what ought. We should be having the conversation about what that is do we want to retain, what that is do we want to jettison, and how much freedom do we have to move things. And we have much more freedom than, than those who are uh, pushing a naive symmetry uh, would imagine. We have a lot of freedom to refigure the dynamics of male and female, and we should do it. Because th this, I guess, is the, 
is the concern that when people talk about evolutionary biology as saying, well, this is our evolutionary toolkit, men and women have different evolutionary toolkits, what people then hear is a sense of this is unchangeable. This is, we're, we're then in a binary between the conservatives' view that we're kind of basically, we're going to have to go back to the 1950s and the liberal idea. And how do we transcend that kind of, that, that, the, the culture war? Unfortunately, there is a kind of failure of understanding that extends into evolutionary biology and also exists in a widespread form in public, which has to do with evolution being synonymous with genes. So when people talk, they will say, is it biological or is it cultural? Well, that's not a good dichotomy. It happens that culture is equally biological as genes and once we understand that, then we will realize that to say that some dynamic is evolved and that's why it exists in the present does not mean it's inflexible because if it's evolved but it is transmitted culturally, we actually have an opportunity to, to alter that landscape. So if we look at, for example, female fighter pilots, there's no reason that females should not be fighter pilots if that's what they want to do. But warfare has always been the province of men. Does it need to re remain the province of men? That's a discussion we can have. But there's no technical reason, and obviously the fact that there are female fighter pilots tells us that we can retune that dynamic any way that we think is right. And lots of things in, in, this, in this area work that way, where they are evolved, there's a history, but it is transmitted in a way that it is amenable to being altered.